Joshua 4, verses 1 through 7. And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them saying, take for yourselves 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place. Somebody say lodging place. Where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan. And each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a... I said, and these stones shall be for a... to the children of Israel for how long? There's an exhaustion that comes to us spiritually, and then it plays out naturally from remembering and rehearsing the wrong things. There's an exhaustion that comes to us that comes from us always picking up on what negative happened and what negative has been done and what negative has been said and then internalizing that and rehearsing the negative event, the negative experience over and over and over again until the negative event and experience becomes a part of us and we become a part of it. If we're honest, some of us are here this morning and we've been rehearsing stories that happened to us when we were 9 and 10 and 11 and 12 and 13 and 14 and we've rehearsed them stories. We are in our 40s and our 30s and our 50s, 60s, 70s and we're still rehearsing stuff that happened way back when, like it happened just now then. And this memorializing, because when we memorialize, we take an event and an experience, we pull something from it, and we set it up in such a way that we revere it and honor it, and we keep on rehearsing it. And the challenge with the stories that we tell ourselves is after a while, they're not just stories, they become tools that shape our lives. After a while, the stories that we tell, tell the story of what we've become. The power of memorial is so significant that when we look in the Old Testament, we see God over and over and over again. When he showed himself strong, when he showed his love, when he showed his power, when he showed his commitment to his people, when it was over, he would tell them, write this down and make a memorial of it. Build something, build a structure, make a memorial. He, we often see him when he's shown up in unexplainable, miraculous ways. He wants them to remember that. As we dig into this text in Joshua chapter 4, I want to Go back to these first three verses again. And it came to pass when all the people, how many of them, had completely crossed over the Jordan, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them, saying, take for yourselves 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them, carry what these boulder-sized rocks over with you and leave them in the, that was your part, and leave them in the, where you lodge tonight. What we remember and what we rehearse matters. The children of Israel are crossing the second great body of water that they've 
crossed over as a people. We see them first crossing over the Red Sea. They've got a troop and an army, the greatest troop and army in the world from Egypt, hunting them down to take their lives. And they come to the Red Sea. Moses cries out to God, what should we do? And God asks him, what does he have in his hand? He parts the sea like pulling back curtains in two and they pass over the Red Sea. And then when the uh, Egyptians try to do what they did, the sea closes up on them and drowns the Egyptians. We see God memorialize that with they write a song. God spot, give him 16 bars and write a song, write a spot. And they begin to sing and memorialize what God has done. God has to give us memorials because our tendency is to remember the wrong thing out of the right events. If he hadn't told Miriam, I believe it was, to write the song, you go back and check it this week. But if the song hadn't been written and they hadn't sang the song, maybe they would have remembered the faces of the Egyptians as they came, the sound of the chariots as they pursued them. But God has to keep intervening in our lives and tell us what he wants us to remember because what we remember and rehearse matters. After a while, the stories that we tell ourselves no longer become stories. They become more real than reality. In fact, all of us in this room are more shaped by what we keep saying to ourselves over and over again than we are by what just got said to us. In fact, after a while, we, we, we filter what is said to us with, does that go with the narrative that I've been telling myself? Then we see them crossing this second body of water. Now they, one body of water took them from being slaves to free people. Now they've been in the wilderness and they come to this other body of water and God tells them to prepare themselves because tomorrow you go over this Jordan and the Jordan River, it was harvest time. Sometimes it seemed like God always picked the worst times to do stuff. I could have felt more confidence about it, God, if you didn't pick the time when the Jordan River has swelled to its biggest. It's harvest time. It's been raining now, and now the thing has swelled to be almost two miles wide, historians tell us. It had swelled to the point that it was over 200 feet deep in some areas. Why didn't he pick the dry season when we could have kind of walked through? He didn't pick them because then it wouldn't have forced you to have dependence on him. He'll pick the times when you wouldn't have done it because it's not you doing it. It's him doing it. He'll pick the way you wouldn't have gone because it's not you going. It's him shepherding you. And he does that because his intent is that he uses these times to be pivotal. They look at it as something insurmountable and impossible. And God is wringing his holy hands with excitement saying, this is the pivotal moment where they get to see that I am God. And they are my people. When they cross over the Jordan, they now go from being a multitude of freed slaves, just a horde of people that have been freed from slavery. And when they get on the other side, now he's established a nation. It's interesting the way God did the Jordan because he did it different than the Red Sea. If you go back and read Joshua chapter 3 for your devotion this week, you'll see that what God did was he became almost like a supernatural crossing guard. He, he walked up to up the Jordan, if you will, and towards this part of the Jordan, he just stopped all the water and made the water heap up. There was nothing else to run down and feed the other parts, so the water kept running there while he held up this part. And then the children of Israel with the priest stepping in first. The moment the priest stepped in with the Ark of the Covenant, it says that the water heaped up. Didn't separate it this time on both sides and part it like that. He just stopped one side, nothing fed that side, and they walked across. I could see myself walking by, like, trying to hold it myself, like, you know. <laughs> Just, you know, you can see some of the men acting like they were the ones holding as they walk over. God's got it. Sometimes we act like we're doing something and, and fooling ourselves. And a lot of times we walk out with the wrong memorial. If I wouldn't have held my hand up, the water would have got us. You ain't have nothing to do with that being heaped up up there. That was all. If you didn't have any hands, he was going to hold that water back. It's important how we remember things. 
sometimes we always tell the story where we end up being a rock star in the story. We think we're lucky or fortunate because of that because we always got a positive perspective on things. But as long as you're the central figure, you're limited by your own abilities. But you, that means every new river he brings you to, you think, am I strong enough because you thought you were strong enough on the last one. You always struggle with faith because you walk from every situation thinking you did something. We ain't do nothing to stop this Jordan River the way that this Jordan River stopped. It was God. And to make sure that we didn't remember it wrong when we got across, he said, take 12 men, send them back on the dry, muddy riverbed and have them pick up 12 boulders, one that represents each tribe. Put that on their shoulder and bring that back to the place that you're going to lodge. This is critical because we're always picking stuff up. We're always carrying something back to the place that we're going to lodge. The challenge is oftentimes what we carry back is the negative thing we saw, the negative thing we experienced, and then we rehearsed that long enough until that's what we believed happened. Some of us go through with an attitude. I don't even know why he got us going in this muddy Jordan bed. Why couldn't he hold it and let it dry? I'm getting my sandals all muddy. I just got my manicure done, and he got us walking across this. Why didn't he have more space between each person? They got mud all on my robe, and I know we're going to take a selfie when we get on the other side, and now I'm not right the way I want to be. Sometimes even when the greatest things happen, we find the most petty thing to focus on happening and take the great thing that God did and just keep on walking. See, he gives them a memorial because our tendency is to rehearse the things we should be forgetting and forget the things we should be rehearsing. Somebody should tweet that. I'm going to say that again. Our tendency is to rehearse the things we should be forgetting and forget the things that we should be rehearsing. You ever been somewhere with somebody, you come out, it was the greatest time ever, you ask them, did they say, and the experience they have sound like they were in a whole different place than the place you were in. Did you ever experience? The movie was amazing. Didn't you love how the movie climaxed? I had a little hair in my popcorn. I didn't even see the rest of me. This nasty theater, that's why I don't even like coming to this nasty theater. I got the hair in my mouth and through the whole movie, I was trying to get the hair out my mouth. I didn't even see the movie. No matter where we go and no, no matter what happens, the stories that we've told ourselves have already shaped us in a certain way and it locks us into being the same results over and over and over again. I get ahead, but I know I'm not going to stay ahead because I'm coming back because of what I rehearsed, and it's exhausting. Somebody just shout exhausted. exhausted. Run with me down here to verse 4. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe, and Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord your God, back, if you will, into the midst of the Jordan. And each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder. Somebody say, these are on your You don't put no little rock on your shoulder. I mean, these were boulders they picked up and put them on their shoulder. You ever carry something heavy, you got to put it on your According to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. Can we do a little bit of introspection right here, right now? What kind of rocks are you carrying? What kind of rocks do you tend to pick up? What kind of things do you tend to memorialize? See, God interrupts the party that they're getting ready to have on the other side. And he says, I want to tell you how to remember this event. I want to tell you, I want to give you instruction on how to remember what just happened here. I want to tell you how I want the story to be told because I don't want y'all to write the script your way. Get 12 of them brothers, get back over there. And they're like, we got to go back in there. We happy we made it out. We didn't know the thing. Go back in there and go to the middle, 200 feet down there and down. Walk a half mile or a mile out there. Get those big boulders and bring them back on the shore. 
it's funny, sometimes we get an attitude when God tells us what to remember when we normally come back with our own chips on our shoulder anyway. <laughs> That's where that saying came from. They got a chip on their shoulder. What they're really saying is they got a story they rehearse over and over. Sometimes you wonder, what happened? What, 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 did somebody do something to them? Did I miss something? They got a chip. So I say, we got a chip. You better tell on yourself today. You think about your neighbor. God's talking to you. We got a chip on our shoulder that keeps making no matter what God does, no matter how God does it, I ain't all that moved. And the reason we're a lot all that moved is because there's something already on my shoulder. I can't pick up the memorialized memory the way God wants me to because I already have memories that are shaping me already. I have already decided I'm the one with an attitude. And if you ask me, I'll tell you why I have an attitude. So I don't care what happened today. I'm not picking up the memorial you want me to pick up, God, because I already picked up my chip. And everybody with a chip on their shoulder looked straight ahead and just said, they ain't talking to me. I'm glad I brought you here today. This is for you. But no, God would not write this prescription for us today. If he wasn't talking to each and every one of us. In fact, we're in worse shape if we can't quickly identify our own chip. Holy Spirit, right now, I just pray that you would shine a supernatural light on us right now. Take us to the roots of when we went to riverbeds we had no business going and picked up boulders you didn't tell us to pick up and built memorials that exist now in our lives. Here's the challenge in Jesus' name. When we build memorials, what we do is we give Satan access to a sacred place in us. The Bible says that as we think in our as we think in our sacred place, so are we. No matter what happens, he could have been the best guy in the world, but when he get done with you, he's a bum like all the rest of them. She could have been the most faithful woman that you ever came across, but when she done with you, she a beep like all the rest of them. <laughs> could have been the best job in the world, but once you get there for a year, I don't even know why anybody works there. They should shut that place down. They should file chapter 13 tonight because they're not going to make it. The plan is bad. The people are bad. The technology is bad. It's all bad. You first started out at the church. You were like, I, I like this place. But after a while, because something has been memorialized in my sacred place, over time, I end up at the same rerun that I always end up at. And when I should have been delivered from slavery and brought into freedom, and when I should have been delivered from being a nomad and brought into being an established place, I'm still enslaved. Because of the stories I tell myself over and over and over. And we are seduced into believing that by telling myself my stories, I protect myself. As long as I remember what that joker did, another joker will never do it to me again. He don't have to do it to you again because now you do it to your. This is your fourth spouse. Look at me. Look at me. You can't stay at a job. From day one, you start to build a case against them. <laughs> yep, yep. What are you doing? You are rehearsing your memorial. Something has entered into your sacred place that never should have been in there because what enters into our sacred place are only the rocks that God tells us to pick up. I just sense a deliverance coming to us right now in the name of Jesus. I just, I just, I just sense... I just sense burdens and stones and bricks and boulders and chips. Come on, anybody else sense that, that we've picked up, that have mounted up and piled up on us, that have us exhausted? Because no matter how much I get, it's not enough. No matter how many good days I get, I know I'm going to get reset right back to where I always was. Because as, a, as we think in our sacred place, in our hearts, so are we. 
Come on, if you're getting delivered right now, you got to do something delivering right now in the name. Memorialize this moment for yourself right now. Memorialize this moment for yourself. Forget everybody to the side and the left. Pick up something, put it on your shoulder, and start to bless God with your mouth right now. I'm being delivered in my sacred place right now. I'm getting free. The last day of me telling that story is today. Because right now, I'm not giving Satan that spot inside of me no more. You're not messing up every river crossing that I experience over and over and over again. I'm making room in my sacred place right now. We telling God settle here. He's like, where? Ain't nowhere I can settle up in here. It's rocks all over the place. <laughs> you talking about settle down. And right now God is throwing his weight around and just moving this out of us. And you can take people to a new place, but only God can make us a new people. Yeah. So we can take ourselves to a new place. But only God can make us a new, a new what? 6B. When your children, I said when your children ask in the time to come, saying what do we, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel for how long? I got to read it slow. I think you missed. Well, when your children ask in time to come, Saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel for how long? Forever. Memorial is powerful. This is why God says only I can take this memorial because memorial is powerful. Memorial belongs to me. You don't get to remember stories the way you decided to remember. Well, I lived it. It's, I, you didn't go through it. I went through it. I'm going to remember it the way I want to remember it. And you're going to come out the way you don't want to come out. If you want to come out the way God ordained for you to come out, then you better go back and ask God to help you remember it the way he remembered it. Because I held the Jordan back for you and allowed you to cross over. And you sitting here today is a memorial of all the stuff that I held back, all the stuff I fought back, all the stuff I brought back, all the stuff I gave back. And you're going to sit here with a chip on your shoulder remembering something else. When I provided for you, I protected you. I shepherded you. I helped you make the right choice. You remembered it wrong. Because you think you saved yourself. You think you provided for yourself. You think you protected yourself. And that's why you keep telling that same old story to yourself with that chip on your shoulder. Telling yourself the same thing because you think you did it. We didn't do it, y'all. He did it. He got us across a two-mile wide river. He made a two-mile wide river that was 200 feet deep be held back. He became a supernatural crossing guard for us so we could get to the other side. There's not one under my voice that God hasn't provided for. Helped us get to the side that God hasn't protected, that God hasn't shepherded. The only difference between us is what has entered into our sacred place and the stories that we tell ourselves. And the difference between us not only getting into the promised land but becoming the promised people 
is locked up in the power of memorial. He said, this shall be a memorial unto the children of Israel. For how long? For how long? See, memorials will walk up the river to your granddaddy's granddad. And something happened to your granddaddy's granddad that he passed that unsacred thing on to your granddad and said, boy, you better watch out because everybody ain't your friend. Let me tell you the story of what Lord Joey did to me, the way he touched me, the way he entered. Don't you ever trust anybody like that. So now you take that in and memorialize it. It's in your sacred place rather than God, him telling the story of God delivered me. God protected me. God, God brought me out of all the mess that happened to me and restored me. I'm in my sound mind enough that I was able to provide by God's goodness. And that's how we see the stories we tell. Birth children. Some of us have had children of poverty and lack. And, and poverty is over there saying, can you tell me the story about this rock? How is it that no matter what happens with us, we always end up negative? I mean, you, you new hope, new excitement, new business, new start, and we end up here. And the rock, the child that came out of you is asking you, how did we fail? And you say, well, let me tell you. You don't have no idea how much fighting I got to do with the people around here, how much agreement I can never get with the people around here. You have no idea how many people are working against me. And as long as you keep telling that story, that story is going to keep shaping you and galvanizing you. And no matter what God says, God is speaking right now. And some of our memorials are saying, don't you believe all that? Some of our memorials are like, hey, well, he don't know your whole story. Call him later and ask him, can you talk to him? You want to call me and try to mix up the revelation of God so you can have the permission to go back to telling your same story. Because something that shouldn't be in your sacred place entered in your sacred place. And it's not just for one generation. It's generational. Some of the stuff we carry ain't even our stuff. It's not even what happened to us. It happened a couple rows up the river. And it floated down as in us now. But God. But God. But God. God. Somebody say that, but God. Just say lie and let that all settle in for a second. The stories we tell become the lives we live, and the lives we live become the stories we pass on. And the Lord is speaking to us now because he's establishing a great people with us. He wants to make every single one of us able to take into the womb of our heart. What he has declared, he wants us to learn to set up memorials. When you leave, you should ask God, what do you want me to remember about that? What do you want me to write down? What, what do you want me to memorialize from that experience? Y'all hear what I'm saying? No more do you give your imagination permission to remember whatever it wants. No longer do you give your memory a chance to rem memorize whatever. You ask your memory, where would you get that from? Who told you to keep verse that? Where'd you get that from? You asked your intellect. Who told you how to reason like that? You asked your will. Why are you so calcified in that way? You talk to yourself, and then you ask God to talk to you. I just saved you a lot of therapy right there. Right there. You need to say amen. That was a lot of therapy right there. Because the therapist is trying to get you tapped into the narrative that you keep telling yourself. And that I'm not saying you can't have therapy, but I'm saying you need the Holy Ghost. You, you need him to start talking to you about you before we pass this along generationally. Amen. And before we raise kids that, and I'm not talking about natural kids, I mean raise results and circumstances in our lives that we, we agree with. Father, I thank you. I praise you that your word does not return to you void. But that your word comes to accomplish your purpose in the place where you send it. And today you're sending your supernatural word to us. 
I thank you, Lord. There's no such thing as just hearing the word. But as we hear the word, I declare that the word takes root and is implanted in us. You said the engrafted word of God is able to save our souls. God, heal our souls now. No matter how old we are, how young we are, there's incredible fruitfulness and productivity remaining in us. That's why we're here. Today we grasp the revelation of the power of memorial. And no longer do we memorialize what we want. We memorialize what God instructs us to memorialize. Show us what boulders to pick up and put on our shoulders, God, and we will build something that lasts for generations. There is no greater boulder that God told us to pick up than Jesus. He is the rock. He is the rock. He is the cornerstone that everything in our lives should be built around. And if we're going to live this, we are going to need to pick up that person named Jesus. Give him the only right to be the one that rules over that sacred place. And everything else that comes in gets built along the lines of that cornerstone until we end up seeing ourselves revitalized and refurbished into what he's called us to be. The power of memorial. Why don't you just say that at your mouth? The power of memorial. No, you didn't say it like a preacher. The power of memorial. With a southern preacher. The power of memorial. Catch that. Are you ready to live this? No, really. Are, are you ready? Are you ready to live this? Are you, are you ready to live this? Are, are you ready? Come on. Are you ready to live this? Yeah.